what's going on everybody it's ETA Prime back here again today I am super excited because I've got my hands on the all new Menace Forum Nook X i5 and in fact I've also got the i7 version that video will be coming later we'll do a performance comparison but this is definitely turning out to be one of my favorite PCs that Menace Forum has ever released and if you're a regular viewer of the channel you know I've taken a look at basically all of them in the past two years and this one is definitely putting the power down so like I mentioned, this is known as the Nook X i5. I've also got that i7 version, so keep an eye on the channel. But we'll go ahead and get this out of the box. I'm really excited about testing it out, and I've been waiting on this for a couple months now, because this is truly a mini gaming PC. So first things first, we've got the stand here. This is meant to sit in the stand vertically, and unfortunately it's really not meant to go horizontally. But let's go ahead and get it out. So you might think this kind of looks like a laptop, and you'd be really close, but we don't have a screen here. This is actually using a mobile CPU and a mobile GPU, and with the i5 version, we've got the RTX 3060 in here. It is constructed of aluminum, midsection is plastic, and I really do love the look of this thing. Round back, we've got our full-size HDMI 2.1 and Thunderbolt 4, so this will support up to 8K out, or you could just go 4K out of that Thunderbolt 4 port if you want. Now, inside of the box, you're obviously going to receive the Nook X, a stand, and a 230 watt power supply. So this is far from a low power consumption mini PC, but it's really meant for gaming, and I've had really good luck with this unit here and 1440p. When it comes to I.O., up front here we've got three USB 3.2 ports. These are full size. We've also got a 3.5 millimeter audio jack and a full size SD card reader. Now if we take a look near the top, we've got our power button, and we've also got kind of a gaming mode switch button. Initially, I thought this would kind of change the fan curve, but what I've noticed here is when gaming mode is turned on, it does send a little more power to the GPU, allowing you to get those higher clocks. And when it comes to I.O. on the rear, we've got 2.5 gigabit Ethernet, full-size HDMI 2.1, and Thunderbolt 4. So we could connect an eGPU to this if we wanted to, but it's already got an RTX 3060 or 3070 if you opt for the i7 version. Now the first thing I wanted to do was take a look at the internals, and it's actually pretty easy to get in here and upgrade the RAM and storage. There's three screws on the bottom, and you're going to pop this panel off. Like I mentioned, this is constructed of aluminum, but the midsection is plastic. And as you can see, we've basically got laptop components inside of here. We've got two M.2 NVMe slots, so we can upgrade the storage. You can get this with up to one terabyte right out of the factory. Nice cooling system here, so we've got a dedicated heatsink and fan for the CPU side and the GPU side. The Wi-Fi slash Bluetooth module is also upgradable, and you can upgrade the storage. So they do sell this as a bare bones kit. You won't get any RAM or storage, and that'll be your cheapest option if you've already got RAM and an NVMe SSD laying around. But we can go up to 64 gigabytes here, running in dual channel. Now this unit here has 16 gigabytes of DDR4 at 3200 megahertz, but when it comes to the other specs, we've got the Intel i5 11400H, 6 cores, 12 threads with the turbo up to 4.5 gigahertz, an RTX 3060 with 6 gigabytes of GDDR6 VRAM, this is a laptop variant. This will support up to 64 gigabytes of RAM, and as we saw, we've got two NVMe slots in here, so we can go on up with the storage. We can add up to 4 terabytes. So basically, two 2 terabyte drives in here. We do have Wi-Fi 6, Bluetooth 5.2, and this is running Windows 11 out of the box. It's the non-bare bones version, but you could always install Linux if you want to. Okay, so I've had a couple days to mess around with this rig, and I really do like the look of it. It definitely looks like a bigger PC, but since it's so thin, I mean, this is definitely a small form factor. It doesn't take up much room at all. And keep in mind that with all of the games and emulators we're going to see running in this video, I will have the turbo mode on, or game mode. So far, performance on this thing has been outstanding, and when it comes to the built-in fans, this thing isn't loud at all, even at full boat. I was kind of expecting it to be as loud as a laptop, but since we have all that ventilation, it doesn't need to spin those fans up so fast. And through all of the testing that I've done so far, I haven't seen this CPU go over 82 degrees Celsius, and it still keeps nice and quiet even at those temps, which really isn't that bad for a mobile chip. In this video, we're obviously going to be testing out the PC gaming performance of this thing, we're going to run some benchmarks, and we'll test out some high-end emulation. And by the end of the video, you'll get a feel for how this thing performs. We'll also go over the CPU temps and power consumption from this PC. But let's jump right into it with Spider-Man Remastered. Okay, so I wanted to give you a look at these settings here. I was really impressed by the performance, especially given that this is a newer game. We're at 1440p, no DLSS, 
and from the settings we're at high. If you wanted to run this game at ultra, I would drop that resolution down to 1080p, or you could turn on some DLSS, but uh, the way it's set up right now at 1440p high, we're getting some really great performance. And personally with a game like this, I wouldn't mind locking V-Sync on, but I did get an average of 74 FPS out of Spider-Man Remastered on this PC. So yeah, this brand new AAA game is fully playable at 1440p on the Nook XI5. Now before we test out some more games, I did run some benchmarks. I want to give you a look at those. And first up, we've got Geekbench 5, Single Core, 1315, Multi, 6413. So that Multi Core is kind of far off from the Higher Core Count 12th Gen and the Higher Core Count Ryzen 5000 series. But you got to keep in mind that this is a 6 core, 12 thread CPU. Next on the list, we've got some GPU benchmarks with 3D Mark, Fire Strike, 19,054, and finally, Time Spy with an 8,297. Not too shabby given the form factor here, but these are synthetic benchmarks and we really need to test out some more PC games. Hi, no DLSS, and with DLSS you can always go to maximum or ultra with it, but I got an average of 87 FPS, not bad at all, and yeah, it's definitely fully playable on this system. And obviously we're at 1440p, dropping that resolution down to 1080 will allow you to go up to ultra with it with no DLSS, you can get a much higher frame rate out of it, but I wanted to test everything at 1440p on this system, and it did a great job. Next up, we've got Forza Horizon 5, 1440p, Ultra, we get an average of 92 FPS. Again, another fully playable game at 1440p. I also tried the extreme setting at 1440p, but it kind of fluctuated between 64 and 58. So, you know, when something's coming up real fast, loading up, it will drop under 60 with the extreme settings. But again, 1080 at extreme, it's going to run it just fine. Here's Elden Ring at 1440p with a high medium mix. Initially, I went with all high settings, but I did have to drop a few down. We did have those dips under 60, but you know, playing it like this is still great. And you might see that frame counter go down to 59. This is something you'd never notice while playing the game. Here's Halo Infinite, 1440p, high settings, no resolution scale. We get an average of around 79 FPS out of this one. And the final PC game I wanted to test before we move over to emulation was Cyberpunk 2077. So here it is at 1440p high, and this was the first game I had to turn DLSS on with. We're at quality, and we do get over 60 with it. I haven't seen it drop below. We might want to take that DLSS down to performance at 1440p, or you could just go ahead and play this at high, 1080, no DLSS, and lock it at 60. Now it's time to check out some emulation, and this thing is going to run anything you throw at it. Xbox 360, Xenia emulator, Forza 2, with an unlocked frame rate, we can get an average of around 160 FPS, and all you need is 60 out of this one. Here's Wii U with the Simu emulator, upscaled to 4K with Bayonetta 2, using that Vulcan back end with Async shaders. Constant 60, didn't see this dip whatsoever. You could also run Breath of the Wild 4K60 with this setup if you want to, but I would just recommend setting it at 30. Next on the list, PS3 using RPCS3 with one of the harder ones to emulate, at least a harder, fully compatible game, which is Skate 3. And yeah, I mean, you can see from Afterburner, we're up there at 60 FPS, and these were the highest temperatures that I saw out of the CPU. This really does take it out of it. As you can see, we're pulling close to 66 watts from this CPU here. So it's going to get a little warm, but we're still not even close to thermal throttle. And finally, we've got the Yuzu emulator for Switch. You know I like blurring out these games here, but uh, we can see Afterburner. This game is running really, really well. We're at 60 FPS, dock mode, Vulcan back end. So when it comes to Switch emulation, this thing's going to handle it. When Menace Forum initially announced the Nook X, the first thing I was thinking about was CPU temps, given how thin this thing is. But, you know, with the cooling system they have, this works out really well. At idle, we averaged 36 degrees Celsius, average gaming 72, and the maximum that I saw out of this was with PS3 emulation, and you know that thing was pulling around 65 watts, 
we hit 83 degrees Celsius. So we're not close to thermal throttle here. And one of the most surprising thing about all of this was the noise level. Now I don't have a decibel meter or anything like that, but this thing is relatively quiet. It's not like a gaming laptop at all. And I really think it comes down to having that graded back panel there and it's sitting in the vertical orientation. We get plenty of fresh air inside of the unit. Another thing I always like to take a look at with these mini PCs is total system power consumption from the wall. So this is plugged into a kilowatt meter and it's gonna pull a lot more than an APU based mini PC, really because we're working with a dedicated GPU here, but at idle, 23 watts, average gaming, 158, and the maximum that I could get this to pull from the wall while maxing out all six cores, 12 threads, and the RTX 3060 was 196 watts. And remember that maximum wattage is an extreme use case scenario, but this does come with a 230 watt power supply just to be safe. So first impressions on the i5 version of the Nook X, I love this thing. I mean, this is definitely one of my favorite mini PCs. The power this thing's putting out is great for the form factor. And of course, in the vertical orientation, it does look like a much larger PC, but it really doesn't take up that much space at all. Now, like I mentioned, they're also offering an i7 version, and that actually has a different GPU. That one has the RTX 3070, so it's definitely going to put out more performance on the CPU and GPU side of things. And I'll have a video on that one coming up very soon, so make sure you hit that subscribe button and maybe turn notifications on so you know when I post the next one. We'll also do kind of a comparison between the i5 and the i7 version. But until then, if you're interested in learning more, maybe picking one of these up, I will leave a link to Menace Forum's website. You can get this in a bare bones configuration all the way up to 32 gigabytes of RAM and a one terabyte M.2 SSD. But that's going to wrap it up for this one. If there's anything else you want to see tested on the Nook X, be it the i5 or the i7 version, just leave a comment down below. And like always, Thanks for watching.